Howdy. On behalf of the faculty and staff of the College of Nursing, I would like to welcome you to the Texas A&M University College of Nursing Distinguished Lecture 2020. My name is Nancy Farringwald and I have the privilege of serving as Dean and Professor in the college. Today we have gathered for the College of Nursing Wilkerson Distinguished Lecture through the generosity of Dr. Sharon Wilkerson, founding Dean Emerita of the college and her late husband, Dr. Clarence Wilkerson, Professor Emerita of Statistics, as well as a partnership with Phi Iota Chapter of Sigma, our International Nursing Honor Society. This annual lectureship provides a rich avenue of learning for both community and academic audiences. I know that you join me in expressing appreciation to the Wilkerson's and to Phi Iota Chapter leaders for their vision support and their gift to support this event. It is now my pleasure to introduce our 2020 Distinguished Lecturer, Dr. Anuk Im. Dr. Anuk Im is currently the Senior Associate Dean for Research and Innovation at Edith Balsam Honeycutt Endowed Chair at Emory University, Nell Hodgson Woodruff School of Nursing. Dr. Im is an internationally and nationally recognized scholar in the field of global cross-cultural women's health research addressing gender and ethnic differences in health, illness, experience of midlife women. She is a pioneer in the use of emerging technologies to study the experience of racial ethnic minority women and to eliminate gender and ethnic disparities globally. She has obtained more than $17.5 million in research funding through over 60 funded studies and has gained national and international recognition as a leader in this burgeoning field through more than 370 publications, over 200 in refereed journals, and over 350 international and national multidisciplinary presentations. Dr. M is a senior editor of the Journal of Transcultural Nursing and is on the editorial boards of eight journals, including Advances in Nursing Science and Research in Nursing and Health, and is on 13 editorial review boards. She has numerous national and international awards, one of which is the 2014 International Nurse Researcher Hall of Fame Award from SIGMA, our International Nursing Research Society. In 2019, she received the Global Mentor Award from the International Network for Doctoral Education in Nursing for her work in mentoring international doctoral students and serving as a role model in doctoral education in nursing and research. This year, Dr. M received the 2020 Council for the Advancement of Nursing Science Outstanding Nurse Scientist Award. In 2019, she was appointed to the National Institute of Nursing Research Advisory Council. Also, she was selected as one of the 2019 NINR Nursing Director Lecturers. Dr. M's dedication to teaching and mentoring a new generation of scholars is reflected in her efforts made to individually mentor more than 60 doctoral and postdoctoral scholars, 90 undergraduate students, and 70 research assistants. Also, her national and international invited lectures, presentations, book chapters, and service activities represent her efforts to raise a next generation of nurses and to make advances in nursing science. Dr. M has taught courses on nursing theory, nursing philosophy, critical literature review research methods, and global women's health issues. In addition, Dr. M is currently the president of the American, Asian American Pacific Islander Nurses Association. Dr. M will be sharing her distinguished lecture entitled, A Lifelong Quest in Women's Health Research to reduce racial ethnic disparities using technology. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Im. Thank you so much for your kind and thoughtful introduction, Dean Farenwald. Texas A&M, thank you so much for selecting me as the 2020 
Texas A&M College of Nursing Distinguished Lecturer. I'm so thrilled to get this award and really want it to see all of you in person and celebrate together. But COVID-19 doesn't want me to visit you in person in some region. Hopefully in the near future, there would be a chance to see you in person. While preparing this lecture, I was thinking about my research career throughout my life. This was a great opportunity for myself to reflect on my own research program as a whole and to plan for future research directions. For junior faculty members and mid-career faculty members, I hope this lecture would help you decide on your own research trajectory and provide some directions for future research. For students, I hope this lecture gives you some insights and directions on how you could start your own research ideas and questions from your practice and clinical experience. For others, I hope this would give you some idea on how nurse scientists strive to develop their research programs to advance nursing science. Again, thanks a million for this great honor and hopefully meet each of you in the near future somewhere in the world. I promise a cup of coffee for you. Thank you. Thanks again. I am Uno Gim, Senior Associate for Research and Innovation at Emory University. Uh, I am going to talk about my uh, lifelong quest in women's health research through this lecture. Culture is colorful. Culture is elegant. Culture is in our daily life. Culture is embedded in our beliefs and attitudes. And culture is actually everywhere. So as you can guess uh, from these pictures, my research is related to culture and midwife women's health. I started to work on my first research on menopausal symptoms because of my mom's menopausal transition. Although she was obviously in her menopausal transition, she never shared it with her own daughter, who was a nurse. I witnessed her to go to the bathroom so frequently due to menorrhagia and urinary symptoms. I saw her lie down on her bed while quite depressed. Then I was thinking why she is suffering from all the symptoms, although these symptoms could be easily managed in various ways which was the start point of my research program. My answer was culture, Korean culture that devalues women's body experience, including health experience. And during the same time, I actually worked as a brand new nurse in a special oncology unit at Seoul National University Hospital, which was one of the top hospitals in Asian countries at that time. I uh, had a pancreatic cancer patient who had already had bone matter. We knew that he was in great pain, but he never complained about his pain or request pain medication. At the time in South Korea, we are actually giving placebos for, uh, for pain medication to minimize the usages of opioids. However, we gave pain medication to him as possible as we could because we knew that he was in great pain. One day, he requested to move to a single special suite, which was uh, usually reserved for high officials in South Korea, such as the president of South Korea. In other words, the room was very expensive for his family, and we rarely provide the room to a lay person. However, we moved him to the special single suite because we knew that his end of life would come very soon. He could die in the very next hour or a very next day. Once he was moved to the single suite, he sent his wife for grocery shopping. And once uh, he was left alone in the suite, he threw a big chair in the room to the, uh, break the window and jumped out of the 12th floor. And his body crashed on the ground. And as a nurse who was in charge of him, I got frustrated and depressed. 
Four other nurses were also prostrated and depressed. Why he committed suicide at the end of his life? We had a number of seminars and workshops to discuss the case, and we concluded that this was caused by Korean cultural beliefs and attitudes related to pain. In Korean traditional culture, uh, stoicism is highly valued, and people are hesitant to report their pain or emotional sufferings even to their family members. So, as you can guess, my research questions have been what are gender and ethnic disparities due to cultural influences? So, I have two branches of research area, midwife women's health and oncology, especially cancer survivorship. And my focus is always on gender and ethnic disparities due to cultural differences. And methodologically, I always use technology and I used situation specific theories as my theoretical basis. Why technology? Because we can easily incorporate diversities and complexities by gender and race ethnicity while considering multiple contextual factors. And also using technology, we can access racial and ethnic minorities across the nation without time or geographical limitations. Then you may ask why situation-specific theories? Maybe those not in nursing would not know about this specific type of theories. Briefly speaking, in nursing, we have three distinct types of theories by the level of abstract, including grand theories, mid-range theories, and situation-specific theories. Grand theories are about the nature, missions, and goals of nursing, which tend to be too broad to be used in research in most cases. Mid-range theories have more limited scope, less abstraction, and address specific phenomena or concepts and reflect practice, but they are supposed to cross different nursing fields and reflect a wide variety of nursing care situations. Situation-specific theories focus on specific phenomena that are limited to a special population or a particular field of practice. When I was doing my PhD degree, there were no situation-specific theories. There are only two types of theories, including grand theories and mid-range theories. So in my dissertation, I used the mid-range theory of transitions, but I had many difficulties in using the theory in my dissertation because it could not provide the specificity that was needed in my population of Korean immigrant women in their menopausal transition. So I proposed the situation-specific theories as a new type of theory with my dissertation chair, Dr. Apap Melis, who was a former dean at the University of Pennsylvania. Then it became one of the uh, major types of nursing theories in these days. So uh, if you search through Google, you can find more than 500 million sites related to uh, situation-specific theories by now. This was the first refereed journal article on situation-specific theories in 1999. Again, it is now recognized as one of the major types of theories in nursing by the level of abstract. This picture shows my research journey through over 50 funded studies, including over 30 studies as PI. I started from my master's thesis on menopausal symptoms of Korean women. Then I conducted my doctoral dissertation on menopausal symptoms of Korean immigrant women. Then I have conducted six pilot grant studies related to gender and ethnic disparities in cancer pain management, which were funded by several oncology nursing foundation grants and internal grants. Then I got my first R1 study funded by the NRNR which was about developing a decision support system for oncology nurses in their cancer pain management that could consider gender and ethnic differences in cancer pain. At the time, we didn't know that we used the uh, machine learning method because there was no term referring to machine learning. 
but we did use a machine learning method using genetic algorithm and fuzzy logic to process the actual data on gender and ethnic differences in cancer pain experience. Then I conducted three pilot grants funded by ANF, Sigma Delta Tau, and Center for uh, Health Promotion and Disease Prevention, which were about racial and ethnic differences in midlife women's menopause symptoms and physical activity experience. Then I was lucky to get my second R1 on ethnic differences in menopause symptom experience. Then I got my third R1 on uh, ethnic differences in midlife women's physical activity experience. At the time, I was thinking about using physical activity promotion for reduction of menopause symptoms and enhancement of breast cancer survivorship. Then, at the completion of the third R1 study, I detoured the direction of my studies to a behavioral intervention studies. I actually wanted to know more about gender and ethnic differences by exploring sub-ethnic differences using genetic factors. But my program officer at NRNR strongly encouraged me to move forward to intervention studies. Looking back on it, uh, that was a great and wise advice. Due to the advice, I detoured my research directions and I conducted uh, six pilot studies funded by six small grants, including URF, SCC, PUCOR, and Mental Health Challenge Grants. Then I proposed my fourth R1 study and got funded. So the fourth R1 study is uh, to test the efficacy of a technology-based coaching and support program for Asian American breast cancer survivors. So since I just have 45 minutes, I will uh, briefly talk about the four uh, R1 studies, uh, which are larger uh, studies compared with other studies. So going back to my first R1 study, the study aimed to collect the data on gender and ethnic differences in cancer pain experience among four major racial and ethnic groups of cancer patients and develop a decision support system using a machine learning method. As you can guess, uh, due to my experience with the patient that I mentioned, I naturally became to be interested in this topic. The findings indicated uh, significant racial and ethnic differences in cancer pain experience, but actually there was no significant gender differences in cancer pain experience uh, in the quantitative phase of the study. And at the time, because uh, little was known about gender and uh, racial and ethnic differences in cancer pain experience, we used multiple instruments uh, to measure cancer pain. Uh, and across the instrument, uh, as you can see, we found uh, significant differences in cancer pain experience by race and ethnicity. Also, uh, when we did uh, multiple regression analysis while considering all uh, potential covariates, uh, as you can see, race and ethnicity was a significant factor influencing cancer pain measured uh, by VDS, VAS, FS, and PQSF, and BPISF. And specifically, being Asian and being African Americans was a uh, significant factor influencing cancer pain experience. Uh, we also uh, did a cluster analysis uh, by cancer pain uh, using the uh, BPI score and MSA score and affect G square. So uh, we considered uh, the pain score and symptom score and functional status score. And then we got three major clusters uh, by cancer pain experience. So of course, as you can see, uh, low symptom, low pain in high functional status group is one cluster. And second cluster was uh, moderate pain, moderate symptom, and moderate functional status group. And the third group was uh, high symptom, high pain, but low functional status uh, group. And when uh, we try to see racial and ethnic differences uh, in uh, each cluster, uh, we found significant racial and ethnic differences uh, in pain experience in only in the moderate symptom and pain group 
and high symptom and pain group. So uh, in other uh, words, uh, we didn't find any significant differences by race and ethnicity in the low pain, low symptom, and high uh, functional status group. Qualitative findings. So uh, our qualitative findings supported uh, gender and racial uh, and ethnic differences in cancer pain experience. Uh, there were three themes supporting the commonalities among racial and ethnic groups. Across the racial and ethnic groups, all the participants thought there was communication breakdown with their healthcare providers. Also, uh, across the racial and ethnic groups, all the participants thought that they went through the changes in perspectives due to their cancer. So they wanted to live to the fullest. Uh, although the uh, quantitative findings indicated no significant gender differences, qualitative findings from online forums clearly indicated gender differences in cancer pain experience across the uh, racial and ethnic groups. For instance, across uh, racial and ethnic groups, women thought their pain tended to be easily ignored by healthcare providers and family members. There uh, were three themes reflecting the differences among the racial and ethnic groups as well. So white uh, patients try to control their pain, but uh, racial and ethnic minority groups try to minimize their pain. And also white tried diverse strategies to manage their pain, but uh, racial and ethnic minorities tend to normalize their pain. Also, whites perceived their pain experience as a highly individualized experience, but ethnic minorities uh, tried to be stoic to pain because they did not want their family members to worry about them. It was a family-oriented experience. Then based on the data uh, that we collected, we developed the uh, decision support computer program for cancer pain management. Uh, as I mentioned, we used the uh, machine learning method using genetic algorithm. The uh, decision support computer program included three major modules, including knowledge generation module, decision making module, and self adaptation module. And this uh, is the screenshot of the decision support computer program. So uh, when a nurse wanna use the program, she need to enter the data on the cancer patient and then the program will generate uh, some suggestions for cancer pain management uh, depending on the patient's data and the nurse could use the recommendation as needed and then after using the uh, recommendation uh, she or he could enter uh, her or his evaluation on the recommendations then uh, those evaluation became the uh, part of the data and then it, it could be kind of step or that the uh, decision support program. Uh, this study was very unique because uh, this was one of the first internet-based alone studies that were funded by the NIH and also this was the first internet-based alone study funded by the NINR. So because of that, I went through a number of challenges and practical issues that I never expected. For instance, uh, when I submitted this study to the IRB, I should attend a full IRB board meeting to explain the study because there was no previous study that used the internet as the data collection medium in my institute. In these days, uh, with uh, the new common rule changes, this type of study would be an exempt study. But at the time, because of unknown effects of uh, using the internet in data collection among human subjects, everybody was worried. I'm talking about early 2000. Indeed, after uh, my study, my institute developed the IRB guidelines for internet-based studies. Also, uh, there were no guidelines for labs for internet-based studies, and nobody knows about how to install and manage computer servers for the internet studies in my school of nursing. Luckily, I had an engineering team who took care of these issues easily. Also, uh, because of uh, uh, email study announcement, which was very new to the research world at the time, 
everybody was cooperative and positive about internet studies. So it was very easy to recruit the participants through email announcement. But uh, from the third year of the study, I began to have problems uh, with the email recruitment. Because of advances in computers and internet technologies, uh, spam emails began to evolve. So uh, my research assistants were called by the university legal office because they were reported as spam emailers. We had other issues uh, related to the internet study announcements. Uh, at the beginning of the internet era, posting a web study announcement was free in most cases. But as time goes, some begin to request more than 20K for a one-time online study announcement, and it became difficult to identify the legit website for a study announcement, etc. Also, uh, we identified several unaudentic cases of participants. There were uh, several participants who successfully went through the screening questions and internet survey, but uh, we later found that the participants are not cancer patients through uh, their own uh, online forum postings. We also had issues uh, in the use of electronic gift cards because uh, uh, our institute uh, did not have a mechanism to deal with electronic gift cards at the time. In these days, uh, these issues could be easily dealt with, but it was unnecessarily difficult at the beginning era of uh, internet research. So uh, we had many methodological and practical issue papers from this study. Uh, this would be uh, one of the first refereed uh, journal articles on issues in protection of human subject in internet research. I am talking about early 2000. And we also had a number of uh, methodological papers, including uh, these papers uh, on feminist issues in email group discussion among cancer patients, practical guidelines for qualitative research using online forums, uh, issues in internet research in general, and issues in internet survey research among cancer patients. And also we had uh, more papers uh, on uh, evaluation criteria for internet cancer support groups, uh, internet communities uh, for recruitment of cancer patients into an internet survey, and uh, a feminist analysis on internet cancer support groups, and an online forum as a qualitative research method. Uh, from this uh, study, we had 22 publications. So we have uh, uh, one major uh, qualitative finding paper and one major quantitative finding paper. And we have uh, four uh, racial and ethnic specific uh, finding papers. So uh, as you can see, white patients experience and Hispanic, Asian American, and African Americans uh, pain experience. Also, we had a paper on the distance support computer program. Also, uh, we uh, published the two uh, situation specific theory paper uh, papers from uh, this study. Then my second R1 study was about ethnic differences in menopausal symptom experience among four major racial and ethnic groups in the U.S. This was an extension of my PhD dissertation on Korean immigrant women's menopausal symptom experience to uh, four major racial and ethnic groups in the U.S. Uh, actually, one of your senior faculty member, Dr. Sharon Domayer, was a co-investigator of this Aaron study. So briefly speaking, we found racial and ethnic differences uh, in the frequencies of all the symptoms listed in the table. Uh, we intentionally included uh, various symptoms because little was known about racial and ethnic differences in symptoms experienced uh, during the menopausal transition. We also found uh, significant ra racial and ethnic differences in the severity scores of these uh, menopausal symptoms. Uh, when we try to see the factors uh, influencing the total numbers of menopausal symptoms in each racial and ethnic group, uh, 
You can see uh, the differences in the uh, influencing factors uh, as in this table. Uh, r -scale score was actually highest among white women and uh, originally these uh, factors were added to the model based on the current literature on factors uh, influencing menopausal symptoms. So uh, these findings support that the factors from the literature tended to reflect white women's menopausal symptoms better than any other racial and ethnic uh, groups. And also, uh, we try to see the factors influencing the total severity uh, scores of menopausal symptoms in each uh, racial and ethnic group. And uh, there were significant differences uh, in the influencing factors in each racial and ethnic group. And again, the factors from the literature tended to explain menopausal symptom experience of white women better than uh, other racial and ethnic groups' menopausal symptom experience. Uh, actually, the r care was also the highest among white women. And we also did a cluster analysis and we found three distinct clusters of uh, midwife women by their menopausal symptoms. So low symptom group, moderate symptom group, and severe symptom group, as you can see here. So interestingly, only in the low symptom groups, there were uh, significant racial and ethnic differences in the scores of total symptoms and physical and psychosomatic symptoms, which was actually opposite to the cancer pain study, where uh, significant racial and ethnic differences were found uh, only in the moderate and severe pain groups. Uh, I suspect that the reason maybe uh, cancer is a more life-threatening uh, disease and uh, menopausal uh, symptom is more like a natural uh, process uh, and a normal uh, process uh, experience. And when we tried to do path analysis by racial and ethnic group, uh, there were differences in the path uh, through which multiple uh, factors influence menopausal symptoms. The dotted lines mean non-significant relationships and solid line means significant associations. The model fit uh, indices uh, were all satisfactory for all models, but the squared uh, multiple correlation was the highest among white women and uh, I mean it was 41 percent and uh, for African Americans it was 20 percent for Hispanics it was 16 uh, percent and for Asians it was 7 percent. Also uh, the quarterly findings uh, from online forums supported commonalities and differences in menopausal symptom experience by race and ethnicity. There were three themes uh, reflecting the commonalities. Across the racial and ethnic groups, all the women thought menopausal symptoms were just a part of their life, and they tried to be optimistic about their menopausal symptoms. Also, uh, across the racial and ethnic groups, all the women wanted more information. Also, uh, there were three themes uh, reflecting the differences among the ethnic groups. First, uh, white women were quite open on their menopausal symptoms, but racial and mass ethnic minorities tended not to disclose their menopausal symptoms. White women perceived uh, menopausal symptoms as universal symptoms that all women experience in the same way, but uh, racial and ethnic minority women perceived menopausal symptoms were unique by uh, their culture. Also, uh, white women tended to control their symptoms using various methods, but racial and ethnic minorities tended to minimize their symptoms. So uh, we had 24 pops from this study. Of course, we had uh, uh, overall qualitative finding paper and overall the quantitative finding paper. And also we have racial and ethnic specific findings uh, paper. So as you can see here, there is a, a white women's experience paper and black and Hispanic and Asian American women's uh, experience papers. Also, uh, this study was uh, cited by the famous women's health self-help book, Our uh, Bodies, Our Steps. Uh, 
And as a feminist researcher, it was uh, quite an honor to be cited in this famous uh, women's self-help book. And also uh, the pilot study of this R1 and this R1 study was cited at the American Psychology Association website on mapping menopause. And uh, since this was also one of the early internet-based studies, we published several methodological papers from the study, uh, which included uh, the papers on the characteristics of midwife women recruited uh, through internet communities and groups, and uh, differences in psychometric properties uh, between internet survey and pen and pencil survey. Uh, quota sampling method and issues in internet surveys among midwife women, etc. Uh, also, we have a paper on uh, situation specific theory of Asian immigrant women's menopausal symptom experience in the US. Then, uh, my third Arun study was about racial and ethnic differences in midwife women's attitudes toward physical activity. Uh, as I mentioned, I was thinking about using physical activity promotion for racial ethnic minority midwife women and uh, breast cancer survivors. And briefly speaking, we found significant racial and ethnic differences in perceived barriers, self-efficacy, cultural attitudes, and occupational physical activity scores. And uh, when we try to see significant factors influencing physical activity scores, we found that uh, employment, body mass index, perceived general health, and perceived barriers, self-efficacy, and cultural attitudes were significant factors uh, influencing midwife women's physical activity scores. But as you can see, there are some differences in significant factors uh, by race and ethnic uh, group. And actually, uh, we uh, selected these uh, factors uh, based on the literature. And as you can see, the literature uh, is uh, reflecting uh, white women's physical activity experience uh, better than any other uh, racial and ethnic groups of midwife women. We also did a cluster analysis and found three clusters of midwife women by their physical activity. Uh, one unique cluster among midwife women compared with other age groups was the high household, caregiving, and occupational activity group. Interestingly, in the bottom two groups, uh, we found significant racial and ethnic differences in the women's physical activity. But in the top group with the high household, caregiving, and occupational activities, there was no significant racial and ethnic differences. Rather, uh, these two groups' physical activity scores were highly correlated with their socioeconomic status. Uh, we also did path analysis, um, as you can see in these figures, uh, we found differences in the path through which uh, multiple uh, factors influence physical activity scores in each racial and ethnic group. Uh, bolded lines, uh, actually, it is red line. Red lines mean significant rel uh, relationships, and the uh, uh, right colored lines are in blue. Uh, mean non-significant relationships. The uh, model fit was uh, satisfactory across the models in different racial and ethnic groups. And the goodness of fit index was 0.99, and the normal fit index was 0.97. So it was quite working well. And the qualitative findings supported uh, commonalities and differences in physical activity experience uh, by race and ethnicity. There were five themes uh, reflecting the commonalities among the racial and ethnic groups. First, across the racial and ethnic groups, all women thought uh, physical activity is good for their health, but they were not as active as they could because of their busy uh, schedules. From their childhood, uh, they were not increased to the physical activity because of their gender. However, they wanted to get involved uh, in physical activity because of their family history of chronic diseases such as diabetes, stroke, and heart diseases. 
but they did not have accessibility to physical activity because of a dangerous neighborhood and no exercise uh, facilities and so on. And also there were four themes reflecting the differences among the racial and ethnic groups as well. White women thought physical activities are necessaries for them, but racial and ethnic minority women thought physical activities were luxury. And white women uh, preferred organized uh, physical activities such as aerobic exercise sessions and yoga sessions. But ethnic minority groups uh, tended to prefer uh, natural physical activity such as walking. Also, white women perceived physical activity as individual experience, but racial and ethnic minority group thought physical activity is a family-oriented experience. They could not do physical activity due to family events. If uh, they could do physical activity, they wanted to do physical activity within their family members. Interestingly, white women and Asian women wanted to increase their physical activity for their beauty idea, so-called slim body. However, African Americans and Hispanic women wanted to do physical activity just for their health while perceiving uh, their curvaceous body as culturally acceptable body appearance. Uh, we actually used uh, these cultural examples as the basis for our uh, physical activity promotion program later. We had 22 pubs from this study, including the papers on major findings. And also we had the uh, ethnic specific findings. Uh, again, these ethnic specific findings were later used for development of technology-based coaching and support programs for cultural tailoring. And uh, these studies were cited uh, in many research textbooks, uh, including the famous Bones and Groves Nursing Research Book. And in this book, uh, this are one study on ethnic differences in midwife women's attitudes toward physical activity was specifically cited. And I was also highlighted as a nurse reader using internet communication for data collection. And we also uh, developed two situation-specific theories, uh, one on the middle women's attitude towards physical activity, and the other for physical activity of uh, middle Korean immigrant women. And these theories uh, became the theoretical basis for development of two technology-based interventions later. And uh, during the same time, my theoretical works from my research begin to be highlighted in theory, literature, and media. Then uh, there was a question on how can I incorporate uh, all these findings on racial and ethnic differences and contextual factors for health care. My answer was uh, technology-based interventions. Why? Computer and mobile technologies can easily incorporate uh, diversities and complexities in racial and ethnic minority women's health. As you know, you know there are uh, very complicated uh, diversities uh, in racial and ethnic minority groups. Uh, for instance, uh, only among Asian Americans, there are more than 80 sub-ethnic groups. So uh, with the human brain, it's really difficult to uh, deal with all the diversities and complexities. Also, uh, computer and mobile technologies can help reach uh, racial and ethnic minorities living across the nation. And uh, as a researcher working in a, a local area, it's really difficult to reach out uh, an educated number of racial and ethnic minorities. So uh, computer and mobile technologies could help us to reach out to our potential participants across the nation. Also, uh, mobile and computer technologies can help provide 24-hour access to the intervention across time and across the geographical areas. Also, it can overcome cultural stigma and cultural hesitance uh, due to the use of non-face-to-face -face interactions. So uh, based on the situation-specific theory on Asian women's cancer pain experience from my first R1 study and the findings uh, from the study, we developed a culturally tailored uh, internet cancer support group 
for Asian American breast cancer survivors, and we conducted a pilot study. Then, of course, we submitted the uh, R1 application, and then we got funded for our, our fourth R1 study. And in our fourth R1 study, we are currently testing the efficacy of a technology-based coaching and support program for Asian American breast cancer survivors. Uh, this shows the screenshot of the uh, project website related to this study. Uh, this website includes web pages in five different languages, including English, simplified Chinese, traditional Chinese, Korean, and Japanese. So uh, when a potential participant comes to the project website, she will see the first page with an overall overview of the study and uh, she will see the language choices that she can choose. Then uh, when she clicks her preferred language, she's linked to the website in her uh, chosen language. <clears throat> and as you can see, every web page has five language versions, uh, which are possible uh, because of computer technologies uh, that we are using for the intervention. And the website includes the overall information on the study and the informed consent set and uh, project team information. And after reviewing the informed consent set, if a potential participant wants to uh, join the study, she is given <coughs> five language choices again. And when she selects a language, she is linked to the REDCAP system where uh, she needs to answer multiple questions uh, related to the inclusion criteria and quora requirements. And when she uh, meets the inclusion and quora requirement, uh, she is directly linked to the pretest questionnaire. And at the completion of the pretest questionnaire, she is automatically randomized into two groups, the intervention group and the control group. And then the intervention group uses the program and uh, the American Cancer Society multilingual website on breast cancer, as I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> and then a culturally matched interventionist contacts the participants and provides guidelines on how to log in to the project website and use the program. And the program itself cannot be shared here because uh, of the participants' data. But briefly speaking, uh, we include 15 educational modules related to breast cancer survivorship with some ethnic specific examples from previous studies. And uh, we include uh, 85 online resources related to breast cancer. Currently, uh, we started with about uh, 20 uh, resources, but now we are having up to 85 resources. And we have uh, three ethnic specific social media sites through which group and individual coaching is being conducted. And the preliminary findings are, are very positive. <clears throat> we had uh, significant changes in many outcomes. Uh, we'll share uh, some of them after this. And uh, <clears throat> these websites are also available in uh, the versions for mobile phones and tablets. So uh, here are the screenshots in a mobile phone, as you can see, uh, basically same. And then also educational uh, modules uh, are provided in the mobile versions like uh, this. And uh, this study was actually uh, highlighted in the NBC News uh, about two or three years ago. Also, this study was highlighted in Atlanta Business Chronicle uh, this fall. We also had multiple methodological papers from this study because uh, this was also one of the early uh, technology-based uh, intervention studies. The preliminary findings of uh, this study has been published in Cancer. Uh, in this paper, we reported our significant findings on the uh, changes in uh, cancer pain and symptom experience of Asian American breast cancer survivors by the program. 
The findings on menopause symptoms uh, were actually published in menopause last year, and we reported our significant findings on changes in menopause symptoms by the program. Also, another paper is currently in press in uh, research in nursing and health, and we report our significant findings in the changes in self-efficacy by the program. Also, we got funded by the SPRINT program by the NCI that could help refine and commercialize our technology-based coaching and support program for Asian American breast cancer survivors. So uh, we are hoping to translate the findings from the current study and uh, disseminate this intervention for a larger group of racial and ethnic minority breast cancer survivors. We are also thinking of commercializing through SBIR and STTR opportunities. Uh, I am going to show a video clipping on the project that we uh, completed through the SPRINT program. This shows what process we have gone through to develop an initial business plan of disseminating the program. I had a pancreatic cancer patient with bone meta. We knew that he was in great pain, but he never complained about his pain or request pain medication. But one day he wanted to move to a single special suite. Then once he was left alone and he jumped out of the 12th floor and his body crashed on the ground. Because of Korean cultural beliefs and attitudes related to pain management and uh, cancer, he committed suicide. So currently, my journey is still going on. I want to conclude this lecture by saying thank you to many people. First of all, I want to say thanks a million to Texas A&M and Dean Fallen World. I really appreciate this great opportunity and honor to be the Texas A&M College of Nursing Distinguished Lecturer. Also, I want to say thank you to all my research participants and all my research team members. And I want to say thank you to all my mentors and collaborators. Finally, I want to say thank you to all my funders. Thank you so much for all your support. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Im, for your presence with us and for sharing your expertise. I extend our heartfelt gratitude, and I also will be sharing with you a very beautiful award and a financial gift to recognize your excellence and show our deep appreciation. Congratulations on your recognition as our 2020 Distinguished Lecturer in this International Year of the Nurse and Midwife. You were an outstanding choice for this lecture. Thank you everyone for joining us.